second pick of the season. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Josh Shepherd uh, from the University of Oxford. Uh, and Josh is going to talk about the experience of acting and the structure of phenomenal consciousness. Josh. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everybody. Do I sound all right? Is everything good? OK. Right, so I'm going to talk about the experience of acting, which is an experience type that I think is really quite interesting. It's received a bit of attention in philosophy and in cognitive science, but maybe not the kind of attention that I want it to receive. So that's in part what this talk's going to be about. Uh, just to get us in the right kind of headspace initially, there's seats up here. I'm going to start out by reading a passage from a short story by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, the reason I'm going to do that is because I take the passage to be a bit of agentive phenomenology. It's about the experience of this guy named Nick as he engages in a bit of action. He's fly fishing. Just so you don't get scared that this thing's going to turn into a, a literary event. Um, it only lasts for three slides. So, okay. So I'll start out just by reading it. There was a long tug. Nick struck and the rod came alive and dangerous. Bent double, the line tightening, coming out of water, tightening, all in a heavy, dangerous, steady pull. Nick felt the moment when the leader would break if the strain increased and let the line go. The reel ratcheted into a mechanical shriek as the line went out in a rush too fast. Nick could not check it, the line rushing out, the reel note rising as the line ran out. With the core of the reel showing, his heart feeling stopped with the excitement, leaning back against the current that mounted icily his thighs. Nick thumbed the reel hard with his left hand. It was awkward getting his thumb inside the fly reel frame. As he put on pressure, the line tightened in the sudden hardness, and beyond the logs, a huge trout went high out of water. As he jumped, Nick lowered the tip of the rod, but he felt as he dropped the tip to ease the strain. The moment when the strain was too great, the hardness too tight. Of course, the leader had broken. There was no mistaking the feeling when all spring left the line and it became dry and hard. Then it went slack. OK, so there's maybe a number of different passages I could have drawn on to illustrate what it is I actually want to illustrate. I picked that one because I like that story. The main thing that I wanted to illustrate is in this bit of action, there's actually a range of different experience types that seem to be present in Nick's experience. So, there were experience types that Hemingway talked about that we might call agentive. That is to say, Nick was consciously trying to do a number of things. He was striking with the rod. He was trying to stop the reel by awkwardly jamming his thumb into the fly reel frame and so on. There were a number of perceptual experience types. So Nick perceived the sound of the reel, the weight and motion of the rod, the temperature of the water, and so on. And then if you go in for cognitive phenomenology, phenomenology associated with our cognition, Nick did have a few experience types that you might call cognitive. He anticipated the moment when the leader was about to break, for example. I take it this rich phenomenology that's often associated with bits of bodily action raises a kind of question. We might say, how do these elements fit together in experience? And we might also ask, how do they come apart in cases in which they come apart. And what I want to do today is to try to argue about one particular part of normal experiences of acting and give a story about how they fit together that I think has interesting ramifications for psychology and philosophy quite generally. So here's a claim to get us towards the bit that I want to focus on. It seems to me that we don't experience when we act a trying and then loosely associated bodily movements and visual events that follow. Rather, we often experience our bodily movements in some sense as active. And we experience sometimes events in the world as things that we're doing or as things that we've done. And I want to try to give an account of that. So here's the program. I'll start out by talking about what some other people have said about the experience of acting, just as a way for us to get our bearings with respect to the topic. I don't want to assume that anyone knows much at all about this literature on the experience of acting. And then I'm going to take a kind of 90 degree turn as I try to develop an argument. And I'm going to look at some of the things that Casey O'Callaghan has said about multimodal perceptual experience. The reason I'm going to turn to O'Callaghan will become clear. The main reason is that 
I want to make an argument that's structurally analogous to O'Callaghan's argument. So it's going to be important for me to at least get the structure of his argument on the table. I'm not going to make the case that we need to believe O'Callaghan's view to believe my view, but I do kind of like some of the things O'Callaghan says. Then I'm going to, after discussing O'Callaghan's argument, turn to my own, which will then be a bit clearer given that it's going to be structurally quite similar to Casey O'Callaghan's. And then I'm going to conclude and I'm going to try to draw some implications for psychology and for philosophy. So, okay, first I'm going to talk about what some other people have said about the experience of acting. So a number of common sense descriptions when philosophers take themselves to be talking in a breezy way or introducing the subject seem to contrast a kind of active element that's present in experiences of acting with a kind of passive or receptive element that's present in a lot of kinds of phenomenology. Sometimes perceptual phenomenology is used as a paradigm here. I don't know whether that's exactly right, but that's what you often find in the literature. So David Hume talks about the internal impression we feel and are conscious of when we knowingly give rise to any new motion of our body or new perception of our mind. Paul Ricoeur is trying to characterize the body in action, and he finds that he can't do it without also mentioning this active element. So he says the personal body presents itself as body moved by a willing, that is, as the terminus of a movement which comes down from the eye to its mass. Uriah Kriegel talks in a similar way, almost in quasi-spatial terms. So he's talking about the experience of trying. He says it involves the experience of mobilizing force in the face of resistance. He also says it involves a non-sensory analog of innervation, a feeling of a kind of non-sensible current traveling from will to muscle. So I take it that all these people are pointing to something, <coughs> some kind of agentive or active element that's present in the phenomenology of action. Just to locate what some of these people are saying with respect to the psychological literature, in psychology, you find a lot of people talking about something similar. It's always, or almost always, called the sense of agency. I'm not going to use that term much here today because it seems to me that people feel free to stipulate what they mean by the sense of agency, and they often mean very different things. So here's just some examples. Haggard and Chambon talk about the experience of controlling one's own actions. Marc Genero talks about the ability to identify oneself as the agent of a behavior or a thought. Notice that those are subtly different. The ability to identify oneself is different, perhaps, from the experience of being in control. Sean Gallagher talks about the sense that I'm the one who's causing an action. Marcel talks about a sense of oneself as an actor. Sinofsic and colleagues talk about the registration that we're the initiators of our own actions, so they're only focusing on the very beginning of an action. Blake, Moore, and Frith talk about the feeling that we cause not just movements, but their consequences. Now, these people might all be gesturing at something roughly in the neighborhood of what I'm calling the agentive element in experiences of acting. The fact is I'm not totally sure, so I think we might be talking about the same thing, but I don't want to assume that. So when I'm talking about the agentive element in experiences of acting, here's something I've said uh, in print. I say, in consciously acting, the agent experiences herself at once fulfilling the command she herself generates and maintains. And I think about this broadly as an experience of directing activity towards the fulfillment of goals. Okay. So that's how I'm thinking of this agentive element that's present in a lot of experiences of acting. There's a question that we can ask about the place of this agentive element in the structure of phenomenal consciousness. And in thinking about where something like this experience type fits in the structure of phenomenal consciousness, I've been influenced by Uriah Kriegel's work. So there's Uriah. Uh, in a recent book called The Variety of Consciousness, it was just out last year, he's concerned to map the phenomenal realm in terms of determinable determinate relationships between more or less primitive kinds of experience. So let me explain what he has in mind there. He thinks of the most determinable kind of phenomenology as what it's likeness phenomenology. That's the technical philosopher's term. It's really awful. Um, but the thought is, look, when you're in a phenomenally conscious state, 
there's something it's like for you to be in that state. And that's what all phenomenally conscious states have in common. And there are a number of ways of making that conscious state more determinate. That's where you get to what Kriegel calls the second layer within phenomenal consciousness. And this is where you find what he calls primitive kinds of phenomenology. So you might say, well, one way that there's something it's like for you to be in a state is if it's a perceptual kind of state. You might also think that there's cognitive kinds of phenomenology. He uses this word algodonic phenomenology for stuff associated with pleasure and pain. And I take it that it's an open question just how much stuff ought to be at that second layer. Some people think it's just perceptual stuff. All consciousness is perceptual. <laughs> Other people think there's a wide range of different experience types. Uriah Kriegel argues that there's at least six at this second layer. Um, that's not important for me. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the picture. And so then you can make these second layer kinds of phenomenology even more determinate. So there's different ways for an experience to be perceptual. It might be visual. It might be olfactory. It might be auditory. And so on. And you could even go down to the fourth layer if you're talking about visual, because there's different ways for things to be visual. Of course, they can have different colors and so on. So when I ask, where does the agentive element and the experience of acting fit within the structure of phenomenal consciousness, I'm trying to ask, is there a place for it at the second layer? Is there a fundamentally proprietary kind of agentive experience alongside, say, perceptual experience? And I've argued in other work, and some of the, the students uh, that I talked to earlier today read a paper where I kind of make this case. I'm not going to make it again here, but I've argued in other work that, yes, there is a, a proprietarily agentive kind of experience. I'm not the only one that's argued that kind of thing. Terry Horgan's argued it. Uriah Kriegel's argued for that kind of thing. I just want to give you a, a quick flavor of how those kind of arguments go. It won't really help if, if you disagree with me, if you're already jumping off the boat or whatever. But arguments typically go something like this. You might make a phenomenological kind of argument and say, well, look, there's just no good candidates for really capturing, really describing the phenomenology that make reference only to, say, perceptual phenomenology. And so phenomenologically, we're forced to accept this primitive kind of agentive phenomenology. Others turn to more empirical work. So you might say there's a lack of empirical motivation for a view on which you could reduce the experience of acting to other kinds of experiential categories. Lopoulos has got a paper that argues that way. You might say there's positive empirical motivation for accepting that something, for example, the experience of trying is fundamentally agentive. And I've argued for that kind of view. I'm going to take that for granted uh, here today just so I can move on with the picture that I want to offer you. And then ask this question. How does the agentive element that's present, this experience of being in control or this experience of directing your activity, relate to the perceptual experiences you have while you're acting? So it seems clear that while I'm acting with my body, I'm having a range of perceptual experiences. They seem to be related in some way to what I'm doing. What's the nature of the relationship? There's roughly three kinds of views that are out there. And I'll discuss the first two just briefly. I'm going to argue for the unified view, what I call the unified view. The first view, um, you might call a trying-based view or an intention-based view. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but actually a few prominent philosophers have endorsed it. John Searle has argued for this. Christopher Peacock has argued for a version of this. And Uriah Kriegel has argued for a version of this. The basic thought is when you have an experience of acting, say experience of raising your arm, that experience is fully subserved by your intention to raise your arm, or the fact that you're trying to raise your arm, independently of any sensory feedback that you get about your arm actually moving. People that endorse this view are generally moved by a certain picture of some of the relevant empirical evidence. So here's a long passage from John Searle, kind of laying out his case for the trying-based view. He says, Consider this case described by William James in which a patient with an anesthetized arm is ordered to raise it. The patient's eyes are closed. His arm is held down so he can't actually move it. And then he tries to move it. When he opens his eyes, he's surprised to find that he has not raised his arm. That is, he's surprised to discover that there was no arm movement. In such a case, he has the experience of acting, and that experience plainly has intentionality. We can say of the patient that his experience is one of trying but failing to raise his arm, such a case is analogous to the hallucination case and perception because the intentional component, that is the experience of 
the arm actually going up in an active way, occurs in the absence of the conditions of satisfaction. So one reason that I don't think the trying base view can work is I think this is a kind of misreading of what James was even talking about. You'll notice in this case, uh, the guy closes his arm, his eyes, tries to raise his arm, and then he's surprised to find that his arm hasn't gone up. That doesn't mean he had an experience of acting. It just means he expected that his arm would be up. Maybe he had an experience of acting. But actually, more recent work that works with people who've been anesthetized or temporarily paralyzed seems to indicate that they can discriminate between having an experience of trying to do something and actually having the experience of succeeding in doing the thing. So I don't think a trying-based view can really work for explaining all experiences of acting. If you think that the trying-based view can't work, you might be tempted to go to a, a, a mere co-consciousness view. To explain what I mean by that, here's a line from Carl Janet, where he's kind of pointing out a co-consciousness kind of view. He says, when I say a word out loud, there's a mental event, my willing the appropriate exertions of parts of my body, that indirectly causes a second mental event, my having the auditory sense experience involved in hearing the sound I've produced. So Janet thinks there's this active element, he calls it a willing, and then there's this loosely related sensory experience, actually hearing the thing that he's saying. And these are present within the same conscious mental episode, perhaps, but that's about it. He talks about a relationship of indirect causation between them. And in other work of my own, I've articulated a kind of mere co-consciousness view about how triangles relate to perceptual experiences. And the reason I did that is because I couldn't really see how to argue for anything stronger than that on empirical grounds. So what I'm going to try to do today is give you the, the best argument that I've been able to, to cook up. I think that a mere co-consciousness view has got to be right about some of our phenomenology while we're acting. Not everything uh, in our experience while we're acting is given as a piece of action, of course. So the question that I want to ask is, are all experiences of acting explicable as merely co-conscious conjunctions of, say, agentive and perceptual elements. And you can look through the literature. I've searched high and low for people who have talked about this in a way that seems satisfying to me. You get some suggestive remarks, but they're ultimately all somewhat elusive. I think in part because I'm formulating this question in a way differently than maybe some others have. But in people like Elizabeth Pashry, Terry Horgan, Benjamin Mossel, and Brian O'Shaughnessy, suggesting that maybe the unified view is something that they would endorse, but it's a little difficult to say. So Horgan, Teenson, and Graham in an early influential paper on agentive <coughs> phenomenology say that in the experience of acting, there's something phenomenologically distinctive that incorporates but goes beyond the phenomenology of one's own bodily motion. But they don't say much about how this incorporation is meant to work, so how the experience of acting might actually bring together willing and one's body in certain kinds of ways. Brian O'Shaughnessy says, as a general rule, the phenomena of the inner and outer world of consciousness tend not to relate as ships in the night. Indeed, typically a measure of natural unity is present across the main sectors of the stream of consciousness, both between the voluntary practical and the perceptual cognitive. So it looks like O'Shaughnessy might be saying something like what I want to say, but it's not clear to me. And in that passage and surrounding passages, O'Shaughnessy is primarily concerned to talk about epistemic properties of the stream of consciousness. And that's not really what I'm talking about here. So I don't know if O'Shaughnessy would agree with me. So what I want to do now is try to build a case, an empirically grounded case, for this unified view of the experience of acting. And as I said, I'm going to take a 90 degree turn initially and talk about some of the things Casey O'Callaghan has said about multimodal perceptual experience. Now, Casey O'Callaghan's written four or five papers about this kind of thing lately. Uh, they're all quite good. I'm going to focus on one paper of his that's from last year in the Journal of Philosophy. The reason I'm focusing on that paper is I don't have time to go into all of O'Callaghan's work or indeed all of the massive amounts of work that's been done lately on multisensory perception. In this paper, I think O'Callaghan's argument is perhaps the clearest. And I just want to get the structure of his argument out there because that's what I want to use. So to understand O'Callaghan's argument, you need to at least understand this notion. O'Callaghan's interested to try to say something about what it means for a type of experience to be associated with one modality or another. Right? So what makes an experience type visual, 
versus auditory and so on. And this is actually more problematic than you might think, given rich, infra rich uh, data about multisensory integration. The reason is that it looks like a lot of perceptual experiences result from something like subpersonal interaction between processing that might come in via different sensory channels. So Callahan says a mere experience of a modality is one that could take place as one's overall perceptual experience at a time, as though one's other sense organs were blocked or anesthetized. And he thinks this gives him a notion of what it means for an experience to be associated with vision or olfaction or whatever. Then he formulates this thesis. He calls it the thesis of minimal multimodality. This is it. The phenomenal character of each perceptual episode is exhausted by that which could be instantiated by a corresponding merely visual, merely auditory, merely tactual, merely gustatory, or merely olfactory experience, plus whatever accrues thanks to simple co-consciousness. And he wants to argue that this thesis is false. So having falsified this thesis, he's allowed to say the things he wants to say about perceptual experience being richly multimodal, not reducible to experience just in the individual modalities, and so on. So how does he argue against this thesis of minimal multimodality? His first premise is phenomenological. And this is one reason I'm interested in O'Callaghan's work. It seems to me to work back and forth between interesting claims about phenomenology and then really interesting assessment of a lot of good work in psychology in a way that's philosophically interesting. I'll give you the boring version, and then I'll try to explain what exactly O'Callaghan has in mind. So, he tends to put things in this way. In the phenomenology of object or event perception, that is to say you perceive an object, a ball or something, or you perceive an event, something's happening. There's a phenomenal character as of some object or events being jointly two things. He says F and G. Jointly F and G. Where F is associated with one modality and G is associated with another modality. What does he have in mind by making this kind of claim about phenomenology? Well, it's clearest in the case of common sensibles, so experiences that have a temporal or spatial character. So it's possible to have an experience of, say, a friend's voice as located to the right of perhaps somebody that you see that's listening to him. In that kind of case, it looks like your experience has a kind of spatial character to it, where part of the spatial relationship you're perceiving is given through audition, and part of the relation is given through vision. right? Similarly, it's possible to have an experience, I don't know how much this occurs in Edinburgh, where I grew up in Tennessee, it would happen all the time, of thunder and lightning, right? And in that kind of case, you see the lightning and then you hear the thunder, so you're experiencing something that has temporal character, a kind of temporal relationship between something that's given through vision and something that's given through audition. And of course, there's plenty of examples using other sensory modalities as well. Now, Callahan thinks that you can't fully explain the spatial or temporal character of these kinds of relationships without talking about rich multimodal integration. And so he thinks there's this phenomenology of these things being jointly bound to the same object or event. How is he going to argue for that? It's at this point that he turns to the empirical evidence. Uh, and so here, I'm putting this explicitly as a premise, but actually, this is just an assumption that O'Callaghan's working with. I think it's worth bringing it to the surface. So I want to say, here's an assumption that we can make explicit. The phenomenal character that's in question can be given an information processing explanation. That term is mine. I'm trying to make explicit something that I think a lot of philosophers and some psychologists who like to move in between claims about phenomenal character and then claims about mechanism and structure and function often assume. And it's an assumption that I'm happy to share. So what is an information processing explanation, it's not an explanation that could close the explanatory gap. So the explanatory gap, for those of you that might not know, is meant to be this mysterious thing that keeps consciousness somehow separate from considerations due to structure and function. It's the kind of thing that keeps philosophers in business, really. Um, whatever you think about the explanatory gap, information processing explanation doesn't need to be that kind of thing. I think it's a kind of explanation that can do some bridge work between the mechanisms that plausibly undergird conscious experience and the character of that conscious experience. So here's kind of what I have in mind. I think information processing explanations can illuminate contrastive features of phenomenal character. So why does one thing uh, appear to be one way at a time rather than another? It can illuminate 
Structural features, why does some aspect fit into your total experience at a time as it does? I think it can arguably illuminate functional features of consciousness. So what causal role does an experience, or at least its neural realizers, play? And that's the kind of experience O'Callaghan's looking for, or experience, the kind of explanation. Now, these premises are kind of a mouthful, so I'm sorry, but I'll try to explain. So, so here's, here's the, the third premise. It's basically this. There's two good candidates for an information processing explanation of the kind of spatial and temporal perceptual experience that Callahan's talking about. One is that it depends upon co-conscious modality specific information processing mechanisms. Okay, that's a mouthful. Um, the basic idea behind that kind of explanation is this. You might have mechanisms to do with audition that are processing temporal or spatial information and that makes its way into experience. So you have kind of space associated with audition, spatial experience. And you might have spatial experience associated with vision. And these things might be merely co-conscious. And so you might associate them in memory or in thought or something like that, but not in perception itself. There's not going to be anything essentially connected between spatial experience that's presented by these modality-specific mechanisms. The second kind of information processing explanation is this. It depends upon mechanisms that are in some sense supramodal or at least intermodal so that they will integrate the spatial and temporal information into representations that couldn't be produced by one modality alone. Okay. And O'Callaghan wants to say if the data is best explained by the latter kind of mechanism, then we can reject the thesis of minimal multimodality. Now, at this point, there's, there's kind of a mountain of data to which you might turn. I've already said, I'm not trying to make you convinced that O'Callaghan's actually right. I just want to get the structure of his argument out there. So I'm aware that I'm just not going to talk about tons of relevant work in multisensory integration. I'll mention one study that O'Callaghan mentions just so you can get a sense of how his argument works. But there's a lot of really good work that's out there on this now by psychologists and some by philosophers as, as well. The study that, that O'Callaghan thinks is particularly relevant uh, in that 2015 paper that I'm talking about is a study on intermodal meter perception by Huang and colleagues. So let me just briefly explain one of the things that's going on in that study. They were presenting a meter to participants, a certain kind of rhythm that occurs over time and trying to see if participants could judge the meter for what it actually is. And they were trying to present it to participants in two ways, via audition and a tactician. So over a period of time, you would hear some, some beeps and you would feel some taps, right? And then the question is, can you perceive the meter? People are pretty good about this, especially via audition. People can also do it via tactician. One of the tricks in this study was that they gave you the meter in a complicated way, such that if they just gave it to you via audition, you wouldn't actually recognize it for what it was. And if they just gave it to you through tactician, you wouldn't recognize it for what it was. And then they were going to give it to you via both and see what happens. Yeah? So what's recognizing the meter consistent? Like being able to continue the pattern? Being able, so, so the, in this case, they give you a kind of choice. So there were two different kinds of meter. One involved kind of groupings of two, of two beeps and boops in, in a certain kind of pattern. And the other involved groupings of three in a certain kind of pattern. And you were supposed to be able to tell whether it was one or the other. Um, so it's not so much about continuing on. It's just about recognizing whether you were given one kind of meter or another. I mean, I'm glossing over, especially for this study, a lot of the details. They, um, I'm glad the experimenters aren't here. But, uh, OK, so here's how, here's how Huang and colleagues were reasoning. And this, is, again, is just for the purposes of illustrating how Callahan's thinking about this. They say, well, look, here's, here's the reasoning. If the sensory systems process information independently, then presenting the inputs bimodally should not affect meter per <coughs> perception. But it manifestly does. People couldn't pick out the meter when they were just given audition, couldn't pick out the meter when they were just given tactician. You put them together, they get pretty good at picking out the meter. Now, you might think, look, maybe this is a kind of cognitive achievement. People are putting this together in conscious thought or, or some kind of memory-driven effect. Huang and colleagues would resist this interpretation, so let me just point out what they would say. They, they want to say it should be stressed that subjects performed all the experiments without training, feedback, or instructions about where to focus their attention. 
demonstrating that auditory tactile integration for meter perception is an automatic process. And I think they also want to then say that it's, it's genuinely perceptual. Uh, so they say the results demonstrate for the first time that auditory and tactile input are grouped during meter perception. OK. Um, I don't think that should convince you that O'Callaghan's right. I just mean to say this is kind of how the argument would go. And you would look for data that supported this kind of inference. So O'Callaghan wants to move on from this kind of study, plus lots of others, to say, look, the data is best explained by these mechanisms that integrate spatial and temporal aspects into representations that aren't producible by one modality alone. So we should reject the thesis of minimal multimodality. OK. That's the structure of O'Callaghan's argument. Uh, I quite like O'Callaghan's view, but, but I haven't really given you enough to convince you, I don't think. Um, but it's not super important for me if you buy O'Callaghan's view. What I want to do now is give you an argument for my kind of view of the experience of acting. And I do need to, to convince at least one of you um, that it's not crazy. OK, so you'll recognize the structure of it because I'm borrowing a lot from O'Callaghan. I want to talk about a mere experience of a category where here I'm talking about these second layer phenomenal determinables that I, I brought into play with Kriegel earlier. It's a kind of experience that could take place as your total experience at a time. So we ought to have some idea of a merely agentive experience, a merely perceptual experience, or whatever. For those of you that read this earlier paper of mine and talked about it with me earlier, uh, and I said this was a kind of sequel. One reason it's a sequel is when I was talking about that experience of trying. So there are these studies, for those of you that didn't read the paper, where you temporarily paralyze people and ask them to do various things. And then you ask them about their experience. And they'll say these crazy things like, well, I was trying to do it, but the signal didn't get there. Or I'm sure that I was trying. It was very hard, um, but nothing was, was happening. And it's really uncanny. That's a kind of merely agent of experience that I have in mind here. And just to give you some very non-scientific not even data, just, just auto phenomenology. I, I had uh, some dental work done last year. And so I was going in, and they had to like numb up part of my mouth. And I was writing an earlier paper, an earlier version of this paper at the time. Um, and I noticed, unexpectedly, in the middle of the, the dental work, uh, this side of my face was paralyzed. And I was a little scared, but then I also thought, this is just like what was going on in that study I was just reading. <laughs> so what I can do is I can try to move my, my, my nostril, you know, like try to flare your nostril and see what it's like. So I was a, an intrepid uh, scientist of consciousness for, for a brief period of time. And it, it really was this, this, I'm not trying to argue for my view. I'm just trying to maybe make it more picturesque. Um, it was this uncanny experience. Of, I was pretty sure I was trying to do it. And it was kind of hard to keep, to keep trying to do it. Nothing was happening. It was very frustrating. Anyway, um, that would be like a merely agentive experience the way that I'm understanding it. So then, so then I want to articulate a thesis of what I'll call minimal multi-categoriality. It's a lot like Casey O'Callaghan's. And one way to think about what we're doing is O'Callaghan's making an argument about the fusion of different types of experience at one layer of determinability down within perception, whereas I'm talking about stuff up at the second layer. So I want to say, here's the thesis. The phenomenal character of each conscious episode is exhausted by that which could be instantiated by mere experiences of a category plus whatever accrues thanks to simple co-consciousness. And I want to argue that this thesis is false. Right? OK. Any questions at this point? I've been talking for a long time without any jokes. I know people like jokes in philosophy talks. Should I tell a joke? I'll tell a quick joke. It's not about the talk. Um, and I'll tell it. You have to play along. I'll tell it the way that my four-year-old used to tell it when he was four. Now he's six. OK, so here's the joke. Knock, knock. Interrupting cow. Moo. Okay. This guy gets it. I always thought it was funny, but it was my kid. All right. Um, so I've got the thesis of minimal multi-categoriality out there. My first premise, like O'Callaghan's, is going to be Phenomenological. And look, the phenomenal stuff that I want to talk about is maybe clearest in the kinds of actions that Elaine Bennis seems to be performing here. So actions involving multiple bodily effectors at a time. So an action that involves a kick in one direction, maybe a punch in another direction, maybe a, a head swivel. 
uh, all at the same time. So you know something like that. Um, yeah. uh, what I want to say about those things when I just think about the phenomenology of them is it doesn't look to me like I'm trying to do all those things individually and then have this associated perceptual experience. It all feels unified in a certain kind of way. I want to say I'm actively moving my body in space and time, and it's very difficult, really, to pick out the agentive from the perceptual elements. So here's the, the phenomenological premise. In the phenomenology of action, there's at least sometimes a phenomenal character as of an event being jointly agentive and perceptual. So an active direction of the body in space and time and a bodily movement, perhaps, in space and time. That's the phenomenological premise. Uh, it's always possible to jump off just right there, but just give it to me, just for fun. Uh, and then I want to proceed in the, in the way that you might expect. I think we can try to give this an information processing explanation. I think the best candidates for an information processing explanation are roughly two. One would be that it depends on information processing mechanisms that enable some kind of minimally multi-categorial experience of spatial and temporal character. One way to think about that is to say, well, the spatial and temporal character is all on the perceptual side, and the agentive stuff is just doing something else. Second, that it depends upon actual integration, actual mechanisms that enable intercategorial experience. The spatial and temporal character of our experience of acting in part runs through agentive processing, something like intentions and motor representations. And I want to say if the data is best explained by the latter kind of mechanism, then we can reject the thesis of minimal multi-categoriality. OK. So here's where I have to turn to the relevant data. And what I want to do is I want to talk a bit about the spatial aspects of experiences of acting. And then I want to talk a bit about the temporal aspects of experiences of acting. So when thinking about the spatial character of experiences of acting, one good place to go is to work on the rubber hand illusion. So many of you will already know about the rubber hand illusion, but basically the way it tends to be generated is like this. You put your hand out of sight, like say under a table or something, and you look at an artificial hand that's displaced from you to some degree. It actually sometimes matters how far away it is. There's limits to how far away it can be, it seems. And what happens normally is your hand is stroked at the same time as the hand you see. The artificial hand is stroked. It's important that it be synchronous. If it's asynchronous, you don't get the illusion. But if it's synchronous, you will start to experience your hand over there, where the artificial hand is. And it looks like what's going on in this kind of case is you got spatial information from tactician about your hand being where it is. You also have spatial information from vision about your hand being over there. There's a kind of conflict. And it's resolved typically in favor of vision. Vision tends to dominate. This is often multimodal perceptual interaction, at least. So even in the meter perception, one thing I didn't talk about is audition tends to dominate tactician. Because uh, audition tends to be more reliable, it seems. So that's the passive induction of the rubber hand illusion. Lately, people have been in inducing the illusion actively. That is to say, you put your hand out of sight and you move it in certain ways, and the hand that you see moves in the exact same ways. This also generates the rubber hand illusion. So one thing you can ask is, is the fact that action is involved important for the construction of the illusion? Might not be. Your hand is still moving, so it might just be that the movements of the hand are sufficient, or it might be that something about the spatial character of your action depends on the fact that action is involved. So there's a few different studies that, that offer some relevant data. Uh, in the interest of time and in the interest of talking about what I think is probably the best, the best study, I'll just focus on this one by Securus and colleagues. They induced the rubber hand illusion both actively and passively. And then they measured proprioceptive drift. This is a measurement that experimenters tend to think gives you some behavioral evidence that the illusion was successful beyond just the report of participants. So what happens usually is you generate the illusion. People say, yep, it's feeling weird. It's feeling like my hand's over there. And then you ask them, well, where's your hand? Uh, and they'll, they'll point in a measurable way. In this case, I think the hand was, was presented on a kind of screen. It was above. And they would say, well, point to the place on the ruler where it feels like your hand is at. And they would kind of point up closer to where the artificial hand is. That's proprioceptive drift, the extent to which your judgment goes in the direction of the artificial hand. What was interesting about this study is, first of all, that they have both active and passive illusions generated. Secondly, that the, the measurements of proprioceptive drift were different between the active and passive. So what was happening is you were moving your finger, and you were having this finger uh, stroked 
In the active condition, they would say, where does it feel like this finger is? You would make a judgment, you would get per proprioceptive drift, and then they would say, where does it feel like this finger is? The finger that you weren't moving, <coughs> pinky finger. And you would also get proprioceptive drift. But in the passive condition, they would say, where's this finger? You would get proprioceptive drift, and then they would say, where's this finger? Finger that wasn't touched, no proprioceptive drift. So that's what they mean when they say the proprioceptive drift spread to the entire hand in the active condition. Now, why would that be? In the paper, the 2006 paper, they speculate maybe it has something to do about uh, with the action needing the whole hand kind of given to you as an object, so some kind of unity is necessary. They go a bit further than that in this 2007 paper that I'm quoting here and talk about organized, organizing principles in different cortices. So they say representations in primary somatosensory cortex, which is plausibly all that was involved in the passive case, uh, and representations in primary motor cortex, which might have been involved in the active condition, have quite different organizing principles. The receptive field of neurons in somatosensory cortex corresponds to a small, well-defined skin area, which would explain why it didn't transfer drift to the pinky finger, while somatotopy in motor cortex is integrated and overlapping between fingers and hand, which might give you some explanation of how proprioceptive drift spread, namely representations from motor cortex, motor representations of actively moving the hand were important for generation of the illusion. So I think that's some evidence, that's some evidence that the spatial character of experiences of acting integrates these agents of imperceptual elements in the ways that I've been suggesting. Now I want to turn to temporal aspects of experience of acting. And, and one thing to say initially, just as a way of being friendly to myself, is we, we might ask, what should our priors be about this? Is agentive stuff, motor representations and intentions, should we predict that those actually are richly integrated with perceptual stuff to give you the temporal character of your experiences of acting? And I think you might actually go ahead and predict that you should expect to find this rich integration. So just quoting from a recent review on the role of the motor cortex in certain kinds of temporal processing from Merchant and Yarrow, they say, it's now clear that the brain regions traditionally viewed as motoric form a part of a core timing network which interacts dynamically with sensory regions to support a range of timing needs. I say the motor system strongly influences temporal acuity in action and perception via strong dynamic signals that internally represent time, predict sensory events, and drive behavior. Now that's just me uncritically taking on board what they're saying in this review paper. But I think it's not unreasonable to predict something like rich integration in the temporal character of our experiences of acting. Now in favor of that, I'm going to talk about one particular study by Stetson and colleagues. This was a study that ostensibly wanted to study something called um, temporal recalibration. So I'll, I'll describe the study set up to you. They had participants press a button and see a flash, and the flash would follow the button press uh, in two different lengths of time. So in the baseline condition, the flash would appear 35 milliseconds after the button press, 60% of the time. And in the injected delay condition, the flash would follow the button press 135 milliseconds afterwards, 60% of the time. The reason that that happens in 60% of trials is that's enough for you to begin to learn that that's the normal thing. And what they predict would happen, what tends to happen, in this case we now know, thanks to lots of studies that have come after this one and a few that came before it, is that you tend to recalibrate your experience of the distance between these events in light of the normal distance that you experience. So what would normally happen is 60% of the time this happens, you tend to group these two things together as pieces of the same kind of event, the same sequence. And then the other 40% of trials, they just present the flash all over the place temporally. And this can test the extent of this temporal recalibration. So Stetson and colleagues predicted that in the injected delay condition, when you had this 135 millisecond time lag, participants would adapt and would begin to recalibrate such that they would experience the flash and the press more closely together in time. And one way to measure this is to predict that when it's very closely presented, so when the flash follows the button press you know, right after it in some sense, participants actually would experience the flashes occurring before the button press, in spite of the fact that it occurred after the button press. OK, does that make sense? Kind of cool reversal of the temporal sequence of events given this recalibration effect. And this is what happened. 
In the injected delay condition, flashes that occur within an average of 44 milliseconds, that's averaged across all participants, tended to, so more often than not, elicited reports that the flash preceded the button press. So that's pretty interesting. One thing you might notice, and thankfully Stetson and colleagues notice it as well, is that this study involved action, a button press, right? So you can ask, is this a, a cross-sensory or a motor-sensory kind of effect on temporal recalibration? And that might give you some data about how the temporal character of experiences of acting are constructed quite generally. So study two of the Stetson and colleagues replicated the study with one change. Instead of involving action, they took action out of it. The button would rise up to tap the finger. They still found temporal recalibration, but much less temporal recalibration. So flashes occurring within an average of 16 milliseconds, plus or minus 8 milliseconds, so really quite close, tended to elicit these reports that the flash preceded the button press. So Stetson and colleagues make this comment. The magnitude of these shifts is less than half the motor sensory shift, right? Suggesting that active interaction with the world is a powerful mechanism for calibrating, timing, judgments. I want to say, this is evidence that the temporal information that's present in agentive experience includes agentive and perceptual contents integrated in certain kinds of things. So I want to say the data is best explained by mechanisms that integrate spatial and temporal aspects. And so we should reject the thesis of multiple, minu minu multiple minimal multi-category. I yeah, really hate that. I've got to rethink what I'm calling it. It's a pain to say. Um, so just to go back to a claim I made towards the beginning of this talk, we don't experience a trying and an associated bodily movement and visual events following the experience, rather, I wanted to say, bodily movements as active and events in the world as things we're doing, sometimes as things we have just done. What I want to say, I've at least given an argument that the experience of acting's distinct unity in this way stems from a subpersonal process of construction that integrates spatial and temporal contents that are drawn from agentive and perceptual processing, attributing them to the same unfolding event. That's the action. Okay. Now, I regard this as a kind of foot in the door argument. So I think there's probably a lot more to be said about experiences of acting. And there might be all sorts of different things going on with respect to the kind of unity that we might experience in experiences of acting and how it breaks down. So I've talked about one way that you can think about the unity that's present in experiences of acting. What I want to now do is just point out that I think there are some potentially interesting ramifications in psychology and in uh, philosophy. One reason I want to do this is that this is kind of a part of a much bigger project where I'm quite interested in uh, the nature of action control and agency quite generally. I think consciousness is important, but it's certainly not the whole story. I think this stuff is intrinsically interesting, but I often find that this phenomenology of action stuff leaves some people feeling a bit cold. So I want to point out, look, you ought to care about it for maybe for other reasons as well, reasons that might actually get you uh, excited. So one reason that psychologists have been really quite interested in agentive phenomenology is the promise that it holds in explaining certain kinds of psychiatric disorders. So in a number of psychiatric disorders, you find disordered agentive experience, delusions of control, and so on. So schizophrenic agents have a number of different disorders within their agentive experience. One of these is that they over-attribute external causes to their own agency. What that means is, compared to normal, healthy people, people that aren't schizophrenic, they tend to perceive the time of their action as much more close to the perceived effects of the action than you and I do. It looks like they don't really have much experience of what they're contributing to the action, they just say whatever they saw happen, they were like, that's when, it, that's when my action happened. This is often called hypersalient processing of sensory feedback. Now, in my view, schizophrenia is very difficult to explain, and partially it's because it looks like a number of things are going wrong. So I don't think there's any kind of silver bullet, and I wouldn't want to suggest that my little account of the experience of acting is going to do all the work. What I think is this hypersalient processing of sensory feedback aspect of schizophrenia is at least consistent with what I've said about the experience of acting. And it might be the case that we can better understand what's going on there by focusing in a way that people really haven't that much on the ways these agentive and perceptual elements combine in the normal case and might not combine in the schizophrenic case. So there might be a psychological implication. A very different kind of implication involves uh, epistemology. I don't know if there are any epistemologists in the room, but there's this view 
of how we come to have perceptual knowledge, knowledge that's based on perception of our environment, that Jim Pryor, James Pryor has developed called dogmatism. So just to give you a sense of Pryor's argument, he thinks that perceptual experience of a certain sort is very important. So he wants to argue when it perceptually seems to you as if P is the case, you have justification for believing P, and that justification doesn't presuppose or rest on justification for anything else which could be cited in an argument for P. So you have justification for believing P, the dogmatist says, simply in virtue of having experience as of P. Now that's controversial. Uh, some people like dogmatism about perceptual justification, others don't. I'm not a dogmatist. I offer this because, you know, what do I really know when it comes to epistemology? I'm probably wrong. So dogmatism depends on a notion of propositions that our experiences basically represent. So your experience really better be as of P where P actually represents within the phenomenal character of the experience the thing that you're meant to believe. So okay, on the account of the experience of acting I've developed, you might say, well look, they seem to be candidates for basically representing you as acting. You actually experience the action itself. So they might have the right kind of content to deliver this dogmatist justification for knowledge of action. That's a possible implication. That's not one that I'm super excited about. I actually like this one a little bit better. So in a, in a recent paper, uh, talking about practical knowledge, Caitlin Farkish argues that many of the answers to embedded questions that constitute our, our practical knowledge, she talks about knowledge WH, that's like knowledge what, knowledge whether, knowledge why. I don't know how to pronounce it. I get an image of like a baseball bat in the air, like knowledge. Um, if someone knows how to pronounce it, I'm serious, I don't know. I'm a little embarrassed. But um, Okay, so our knowledge what sometimes might be available. She says only through or with the aid of a complex sensory experience. So I'll give you an example of what she's talking about. She's talking about a sailor and how a sailor can know all sorts of things about how to sail that she doesn't know even though she's read a lot about sailing. So she says when the sailor knows she can lean out this far, the content involves a proprioceptive presentation. If I pointed at her and said one can lean out that much, I wouldn't manifest the relevant knowledge woof, because the content of my knowledge would involve a visual third person rather than a proprioceptive presentation. It seems very likely that the ability to perform the maneuver, at least in some cases, requires a proprioceptive presentation. If so, then my knowledge may be sufficient for some purpose, but would not be sufficient for the purpose of performing the maneuver. The reason is that the extent one can lean out would not be presented under the right mode of presentation. So certain kinds of complex experiences might be necessary for us to have an important kind of knowledge. I'd go farther than Farkish based on the stuff I've said about experiences of acting and say it might be that the knowledge relevant to action control, if you think knowledge is relevant to action control, as some philosophers do, relies on content given not just in sensory but in certain kinds of sensory motor experiences, what I've called experiences of acting. And I want to say further, this is the topic of a whole other talk really, it might be plausible that the sailor can't even reason properly about her actions and can't act rationally and intelligently in certain kinds of ways, unless she has this kind of knowledge that's drawn from these sensory motor experiences. So that's another potential implication about how consciousness might be involved in rational control of action. This is the last thing I'll, I'll say, and it's not so much a ramification as it is the kind of picture I've been trying to give throughout the course of this talk. So Casey O'Callaghan starts his paper in this way. He says, since perception matters, because it's our most intimate form of acquaintance with concrete things and happenings independent from ourselves. So the unintentional implication of a, of a claim like that that you will find a lot in <coughs> philosophy of perception is that action's a less intimate form of engagement and acquaintance, but that might not be right. So on the view I've elucidated, the agent is consciously intervening in the world and consciously experiencing the world she's changing by way of the same experience. So the experience of acting might be both an engagement with the world, but also a type of intimate acquaintance with it. So I'm done. Thanks.